Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Schned. I'm the head of project development at the Build America Bureau. Um, and very excited to be your humble uh, MC for this event. Uh, I'll be uh, introducing the panelists and then um, helping facilitate some Q and A with the, with the panelists and taking taking your questions uh, from the audience. Um, today's webinar focuses on federal tools to advance transit oriented development, or TOD. Uh, we have three great uh, speakers from the U.S. Department of Transportation who will provide an overview of their program area, program areas. Uh, including from uh, first the Federal Transit Administration, April McLean McCoy, a community planner in FTA's Office of Planning and Environment, who will tell you about FTA's TOD uh, planning and discretionary grant program. Uh, also from the FTA, Margareta Mia Veltri, a policy analyst in FTA's Office of Budget and Policy, who will be presenting uh, FTA's joint development program and policy. Uh, and from the Build America Bureau, my colleague Robert Hannafin, a project development lead. Uh, focusing on transit and TOD projects, um, pursuing credit assistance from uh, the Tiffy and Rift programs, uh, loan programs. Um, so now let's see who we have in the audience. Let me turn back to the, the poll. Um, let's see, I don't, uh, Hillary, I don't see the results. I just, oh, here we go, okay. Got it, all right. So about a third of you are government folks. We've got another third are consultants. 20% um, transit agency staff, a couple of developers. Okay, so pretty diverse group. Um, let's see, your experience working with TOD. Um, about 50% of you said you've worked on development or TOD projects, but not, that, but not with help from DOT. Okay, so um, no DOT planning or, or grant or financing assistance. Um, and about a third of you were say you're new to this. So great, well, we're, we're gonna, have a lot to talk about and you'll have a lot to learn from the speakers. Um, for, uh, for those of you that know me, um, you know I could uh, wax poetic about TOD and joint development for uh, the entire hour, but I'm not gonna do that. So let's, uh, let's, let's move along and let me introduce the first speaker. I'm gonna turn it over to April McLean McCoy from FTA. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. My name is April McLean McCoy, and I'm the program manager for the TOD pilot program. And at this time, I'll provide a quick overview of the program. Next slide. The TOD pilot program provides funding for comprehensive and site-specific planning that supports development around transit and along corridors. These grants are competitively awarded to local communities to integrate land use and transportation planning with a new fixed skyway or core capacity improvement trans transit capital project while connecting communities and improving access to transit and affordable housing. Last spring, we released our sixth NOFO. And this January, FTA announced the projects that were selected for an award. Similarly to last year, this spring we will release our seventh NOFO. Next slide. The objective of the TOD program is to encourage comprehensive or site-specific TOD planning at transit stations and corridors containing eligible projects. To support TOD planning work that goes beyond what local agencies would usually fund themselves, and to encourage partnerships to maximize chances for successful TOD implementation. Next slide, please. The pillar of the TOD program is the MAP 21 statute, which states that applicants must address the standards within their planning proposal. Furthermore, each proposal submitted and approved through the program must include a maximum 80% federal funding share. For information about eligible sources of non-federal shares, we encourage you to reference our NOFO. But to provide you with some context today, in-kind contributions are permitted, but transportation development credits, previously referred to as toll revenue credits, do not. Details regarding pre-award authority will be provided when FTA announces the funding selections. Lastly, metropolitan transportation planning requirements also apply for this grant. So for instance, all awarded grants must be included in the MPO's Unified Planning Work Program or the UPWP before they receive FTA funding. 
Please note, this does not mean you must amend a UPWP before an application is submitted. Instead, that is done after the awards are announced and before FTA's funding for the award can be used. Next slide, please. Since, since 2014, 110 agencies have received $90 million in federal support to fund TLD planning studies throughout the country. And with the appropriation of approximately 68 million through the bipartisan infrastructure law, the TOD program was expanded by 38%, which is quite significant. Next slide, please. Recently, this January, FTA created a TOD dashboard to house information on each planning study awarded through the program. On the screen, you can see a picture of the planning map that is available on our website. To learn more about these projects, go, please go, feel free to visit our website. Next slide, please. This concludes my overview of the program. And at this time, I will hand the present presentation over to Mia Veltri from FTA's Office of Budget and Policy. Thank you. Thanks, April. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about our joint development program. Um, as Dan mentioned, I am currently the joint development coordinator for FTA, and I've spoke to Re Revolution a couple times about joint development before. Glad to be back today. Um, next slide, please. So quick overview, what is joint development? Joint development is essentially a coordination between a transit agency and a developer or other entity um, to engage in development. So it includes a tra transit improvement, a non-transit oriented development, so a non-transit aspect of the development, a public, private, or a nonprofit partner, and a benefit and cost sharing contract. Next slide. FTA becomes involved in joint development when there one of two scenarios happens. One, new funding is used for the joint development. So there's actually FTA grant funding, funding the joint development or two, which is the scenario we see more commonly, property um, previously acquired with FTA funds is used for the joint development. So there are no new funding programs directly for funding joint development. However, joint development is an eligible expense under any of FTA's um, capital grants programs. So this includes our urbanized area grants, our state of good repair grants, um, rural grants, um, this is not an exclusive list, There's, but any of our capital grants. Um, and then FTA assisted property and funds used for joint development. If, uh, if a grant is received to fund a joint development, it is worth noting that all the requirements of that grant apply regardless of uh, the joint development requirements or in addition to the joint development requirements. And there are also statutory eligibility criteria for joint development. Um, use of real property considerations through the Federal Transit Administration and other federal cross-cutting requirements. The other federal cross-cutting requirements are somewhat project contingent and might depend on whether you're using property or whether you're using new funds, but some that might apply that you should be aware of would be like environmental review or potentially Buy America, historical review, those sort of things. And our FTA policy on joint development is established in our circular, which is the 7051B circular. So if you're new to joint development, that is the first place I would suggest folks look. Next slide, please. So what are the uh, statutory eligibility criteria for joint development? The first is that it creates an economic benefit. And this can be shown in one of two ways. The first way, pretty straightforward, is just that it incorporates a private investment. That's all you need to show. The second is that you can show it um, enhances development and enhances economic development around the transit station. So um, pretty straightforward to show that it creates an economic benefit. And we do kind of read this pretty liberally because we think that there are a lot of things that create economic benefit around transit that might not necessarily be just retail. That might be um, childcare, might be healthcare. There's, there's a number of community benefits that can be lumped within this creates economic benefit definition. Uh, the second is enhances public transportation. This can also be shown two ways. The first way would be that it enhances connectivity between two different modes of transit. So an example we use is a kiss and ride parking lot. Um, sometimes bike share can apply here or 
perhaps like bus lanes that connect to a, um, a rail station, those are all connect, connecting two modes of transit more efficiently. The second way to show this would be that it enhances the effectiveness of transit and also um, is physically or functionally related to transit. So a functional relationship does not have to be a uh, direct physical connection, but we do say generally a functional relationship needs to be at the most within a half mile of transit, although there is no um, set limit for that in, in the statute. The third eligibility criteria is that it provides a fair share of revenue for the partners. Uh, we used to at FTA create a threshold for this because really the goal of joint development is to have an additional revenue source to support transit. That's not federal funds. It's not fair box revenue. It's that's one of the benefits of joint development, right? Is that it creates an additional revenue source for a transit agency. Um, however, we don't have a threshold minimum for this anymore. We think that the transit agency can determine what is fair and reasonable and the partners can agree to that themselves. The Federal Transit Administration does still reserve the rights to not approve a project if, if it seems like the project is not fair and reasonable. However, we do want to give pretty wide latitude, as I mentioned before, for creative projects that provide all sorts of community benefits. So. Um, we, we do leave it quite a bit up to the project sponsor to determine what is a fair share of the revenue they receive from the joint development project. The next eligibility criteria is new. And I think I said four eligibility criteria earlier and I meant to say five. This is um, established in the new bipartisan infrastructure law. This, this requirement states that if equipment to fuel a privately owned zero emission vehicle is installed, fees are collected from the users of that equipment to cover costs of operation and maintenance um, of the equipment. This is a relatively new provision, so uh, I don't have a ton to say on it today, but just know that this is applicable. This was passed with the bipartisan infrastructure le legislation. And if you are working on a joint development project currently, that includes uh, zero emission vehicle charging infrastructure, this is something to be aware of. The last provision is that a tenant pays the fair share of cost. This is similar to the fair share of revenue. Uh, it states that if a tenant is renting or leasing space within a facility, that they're covering a fair share of the cost of operations and maintenance of that facility. Again, we don't have a, a threshold or a minimum for that. We expect that the transit agency and partners can determine what is fair and reasonable um, for tenants. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide. I just wanted to include um, the eligible activities for joint development that are included in the statute so you can get an, a sense of how widely joint development can, can be uh, read. It includes property acquisition. It includes demolition of structures. It includes construction of structures. It includes um, improvements to facilities. Uh, as noted here, there's uh, facilities that incorporate community services, such as daycare or healthcare, which again uh, is something that our agency has been really focused on in, in uh, recent months, is how can we leverage sort of transit improvements to provide other community benefits that are needed. And lastly on here, we have technology to fuel a zero emission vehicle, which I am acknowledging because it is also new, it was added in the bipartisan infrastructure law as well. Um, on the topic of community benefits, there is another legal change that I wanted to note. It is not relevant to joint development per se, but it is relevant to transit-oriented development. And in the most recent um, iteration of the National Defense Authorization Act, there was a change to uh, our regulations, which says that FTA may authorize the transfer of property to a uh, local government, nonprofit, or other third party entity, if that land will be used for at least um, for a transit oriented development that includes at least 40% affordable housing. Uh, again, that's a third party entity, a local government, or a nonprofit. There are some more caveats to this, and there are a bit more requirements, but it's just worth noting that this is a new provision and that it does provide some latitude for. Um, folks who have land with 
FTA interest in the land to dispose of that property without any additional requirements to pay back the federal government if it's going to be used for affordable housing. So something to consider. And that concludes my presentation. I will pass it over to Robert Hannafin of the Build America Bureau to talk about the Build America Bureau's programs. Robert, I think you're on mute. Okay, sorry, I think I was, I was uh, muted. Uh, um, anyway, so uh, thanks Mia, for the introduction. Really, really appreciate that. And I'm really excited to be here today to uh, join my colleagues at the Federal Transit Administration talk about all the great opportunities um, you know, we have at DOT to advance both transit, uh, transit-oriented development um, and create transit-oriented communities. Um, so again, my, my name is Robert Hannafin. I'm a project development lead at the Build America Bureau. Uh, the Bureau is basically the financing arm of uh, DOT. So we're the bank. Um, we have uh, two low, uh, long-term low interest loan programs, TIFI and RIF. Uh, we're also responsible for allocating private activity bonds, um, which Congress actually authorized us to allocate an additional 15 billion as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and across these two uh, loan programs, we have about $100 billion in lending capacity. That's a, that's a huge sum. And obviously we all know there's an immense need to invest in um, infrastructure um, you know, to support economic development and safety and equity and many uh, goals related to environmental you know, sustainability as well. Um, what's interesting and, and worth noting really about loans is they're, they're different from grants, right? Loans you pay back. Um, grants, they're typically kind of free money, if you will, right? Um, and so these loans, we have so much lending capacity. Um, we kind of have the ability to, to basically, if you meet the eligibility criteria as a, as a borrower, as, um, as a project, um, you're meeting federal requirements, federal laws, um, and you can demonstrate you know, creditworthiness, you can repay the loan um, as a borrower, as, as, a, as a pledge too, um, we're able to give you the loan. So that, what that means is that these are not necessarily competitive programs. Um, the Bureau is not evaluating uh, different projects against each other. Um, and because we have so much money to lend, um, this, is, this is an inherent great opportunity uh, for those that are looking for, for long-term low interest loans to provide either complementing or um, alternative sources of money to advance their projects. Uh, the Bureau's other mission is to provide technical assistance. So really to help different sponsors or applicants explore and optimize funding financing scenarios and options, um, explore different uh, project delivery options like P3s, um, work with, with them and, and the most really navigate the regulatory compliance process. Um, and also we have technical assistance grant programs. Um, one of them that's, that's been in place that we, I think this week, the, the, the application period just closes the Regional Infrastructure Accelerators Program. Uh, fortunately, Congress actually allocated an additional 12 million. Um, so there, the, uh, we foresee this possibly being additional rounds, uh, but we just, we just wrapped up our second round, haven't made the selection. It was just the application period closed. And I, I believe it's this week. And then the two new technical assistance grant programs um, that we're going to be uh, building it from, from the bipartisan infrastructure law is the rural and tribal technical assistance grant and then a uh, technical assistance grant for asset monetization. Um, so like I said, we have, we have two main loan programs um, you know, relevant to, to TOD. Um, one is TIFIA, which is Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act. It's, it's a mouthful. Um, this is a more broadly surface transportation focused um, loan program and that we can finance all sorts of surface transportation projects and airports now due to the infrastructure law. Um, we can also finance public infrastructure around qualifying stations as well as economic development projects and the economic development projects um, uh, provision is also new from the infrastructure law as well. Uh, we can finance up to 33% of eligible project costs. It's a standing practice and we can do 49% in rural areas. Um, with Antifia, we have 70 billion in lending capacity. And then on RIF, this one is more focused. Um, it's on railroads. Historically, traditionally, it's been passenger rail, freight rail, commuter rail. Um, and it's also had a transit oriented development, economic development provision um, to finance TOD as well. Uh, we can finance up to 100% for railroad projects. And then by statute, we can finance up to 75% uh, for TOD economic development projects. And the lending capacity. Um, under RIF is 30 billion. And like I said, this is a more railroad focused program. So the type of 
qualifying stations for TOD is a little bit more restricted than under TIP. Yeah, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Um, so why do why do folks uh, pursue bureau loans? Um, one of them, one of the reasons is we offer very long term repayment periods. Really, kind of these are products that aren't offered by the private sector, and really compared to uh, many bonds, um, you know, we have benefits that you know kind of uh, outweigh you know many of many of the strings attached. And for folks that are already kind of federalizing many projects, um, this is a very uh, beneficial kind of cost saving measure um, that again provides a lot of flexibility. Like I said, we can we can actually do uh, loans up to because of the infrastructure up to 75 years. Um, that was increased from the a 35 year period. You can defer uh, repayment up to five years so following substantial completion. Um, you know, you don't start accruing interest on the loan until you withdraw funds. There's no prepayment penalty. Um, it's, as far as repaying, um, you know, the loans, we can kind of sculpt that debt service and repayment based on the needs of the borrower. So there's a lot of just flexibility here, again, in what these kind of products can offer compared to what, the, you know, the alternatives might be in terms of maybe doing uh, bonds or other, you know, private loans. Um, and again, one of the big ones is actually the low interest rate. We basically offer the treasury rate um, on a, a, a loan. Uh, it's related to either the um, the life of the asset. So we, you know, uh, if, if you're doing a, a project for which the uh, useful life is 15 years, say like a bus is like 12 to 18 years, then that would be the, the limit of the, the loan terms. Um, but the interest rate itself is actually linked to the corresponding treasury security of similar maturity. That means if you're doing a 30 year, 30 plus year loan, we're going to look at the 30 year treasury rate, which today is about 2.82%. It's been going up the past few weeks, um, which I'm sure everyone's been you know, very aware of. Uh, and so these just these, these programs provide just additional benefits um, and, and it's significant, I should say significant cost savings and flexibilities um, compared to the alternative. It's also important to note that the Bureau uh, TIPI and RIF do not finance um, operations. Um, and, and maintenance activities, you know, the specific activity of doing that. Um, you know, we can do O&M ca facility capital projects. Um, in terms of eligible projects and borrowers, like I said, TIPI is pretty broad. Um, surface transportation is eligible under TIPI, roads, bridges, uh, transit vehicles, ped bike infrastructure, ITS, you know, TOD, both public infrastructure around stations, as well as vertical kind of private development. Um, it, it is it is a more broad program, um, and you know a, as you kind of think about what are all of the investments that go into building out transit oriented communities. Not everything is just TOD, and not everything is just the transit station. There's a lot of other really critical investments that need to be made in in infrastructure, and not just transportation infrastructure. Um, so the the eligible borrowers under TIPIA also pretty broad. Public and private entities are. Are both eligible, and that would include possibly, you know, a developer partner or you know, local government. Um, the one caveat is that for private borrowers, there needs to be some type of po public sponsorship for planning and programming requirements. Um, so when you know a project it needs to, you know, be part of a TIP, SIP, uh, tra sorry, transportation improvement program, or um, regional um, or metropolitan tr transportation plan, um, that public entity is kind of sponsoring uh, that project on behalf of the, the, the private borrowers. On the RIF side, more restricted, railroad focused. Um, uh, there's this transit oriented development provision under there. Um, as far as eligible borrowers, also a little bit you know more restricted. It's railroads, um, uh, state, local governments, other um, government sponsored entities. There's also this joint venture kind of path to eligibility. And, um, it's basically uh, a way in which other borrowers entities that are not on this list could potentially be, um, uh, you know, financial obligor be on the loan and borrow from us is that they have some type of joint venture agreement with one of the, the parties um, listed above uh, it, that kind of speak to the mutual benefits and contributions to implementing advancing this project. So it's kind of this additional uh, path to eligibility, uh, which is, you know, particularly relevant for, for TOD projects, you know, when you're thinking about developer partners. Um, I want to mention the Rural Project Initiative. This is specific to TIFI, and I briefly mentioned this and that we can finance as a 49% for the RPI program. Uh, rural is defined differently under TIFI. And then, uh, you know, there's also a constraint on the maximum project cost as well. Um, we actually, one of the benefits is not just the 49% um, financing, it's also that we can finance at half the treasury rate. 
Um, and also for small projects that are under 75 million, uh, we can uh, potentially reduce or waive the borrower fees, the advisor fees for legal and financial advisors that um, usually the applicants pay for. Um, I'll mention this because uh, you know the Bureau and kind of standing up this pipeline and portfolio of transit-oriented development projects, we recognize that there's a lot of projects out there, especially you know what we've seen is kind of in our own pipeline, um, projects that have both transportation and non-transportation elements. And um, many small towns in rural areas have, you know, immense need in terms of, you know, civic improvement, civic building investments and upgrades and also just transportation. And so there's kind of this really interesting opportunity here because the RPI program has all the, the eligibility of TIPIA normally would have, which includes the TOD provision as well as all the surface transportation. There's a really kind of interesting um, potential here for, for projects that combine multiple types of uses. Um, and, and, and to kind of one one project, um, bundling different uses and um, cobbling together all these different um, uh, sources of money or financing across the federal government and different departments and programs. So key program requirements. Uh, these are federal loans. Uh, the project has to meet federal requirements. It's NEBA, Buy America, Davis-Bacon. Um, I probably won't list all of these, but I'll mention a few. Uh, minimum project costs. Um, need to exceed 10 million for TIFIA, that's, that's POD specific also. Uh, the project needs to receive an investment grade rating, including the senior debt, um, debt senior to the, the TIFIA loan. Um, and the reason for that is that the, the, the federal government actually uh, pays the credit subsidy. And so we have the minimum you know, investment grade rating threshold in order to do so. On the RIF side, there's no minimum um, project costs and there's no maximum loan value. Um, this is actually a slight slight change from the infrastructure law. Um, Congress did um, allocate, appropriate, uh, I think about $15 million for credit subsidy under RIF. I think half of that is for short line uh, railroads, so it's not you know, applicable to, to TOD. Um, the Bureau also has some policy development um, to, to work on in terms of how we're gonna prioritize um, that uh, credit risk. Um, subsidy uh, for each project. And then again, maximum loan value is 75% for TOD projects. Uh, the Bureau has a pretty robust transit portfolio. Um, we've done projects all across the country, um, different types of projects, uh, bus, um, rail lines, heavy rail, light rail stations, um, most regions. Um, many of these projects also include FTA grants. Um, I think we've, we've done at least one um, transit project um, that also have, you know, for every uh, uh, FTA grant program there is, as kind of a complementary source of funding. Uh, there's a huge range in project sizes from 17 million to one plus billion. So, um, you know, on the transit side, we've built this very, very robust pipeline and, and robust portfolio projects, but really TOD has kind of been this new frontier um, uh, for, for the Bureau in terms of financing TOD projects and infrastructure. And so I, I kind of want to focus in on uh, what exactly the Bureau can do? Like, what is, what is, what are the TOD provisions and what are those eligibilities? Um, when we, when, and, and then also, what do I mean when I talk about transit oriented development? So, um, like I said, both TIF, both programs, TIFIA and RIF, have a TOD provision. Um, and I say the word TOD loosely. Really, I mean it's kind of more broader, inclusive, uh, maybe more transit oriented communities, and and not just ex explicitly or exclusively um, private vertical development. So. Under TIFIA, I'll just say upfront that um, under our own statute, basically TIFIA can finance capital projects that FTA can fund. Um, that's by statute. So any, any transit project that FTA can fund, the Bureau can finance through TIFIA. Mia had mentioned in, in the last presentation that joint development is a capital project, right? And there was like that, that long list. I think there's like 15 different types of joint development projects. So those are, those are, those are FTA capital projects defined by chapter 53. The Bureau can finance all of those, all of those types of projects um, uh, for TIFIA, I should say. Uh, we also have an additional provision, TOD kind of public infrastructure, um, another, another kind of clause under, under the chapter 53 eligibility, which basically is that we can finance uh, public infrastructure located within walking distance of and accessible to uh, certain types of stations. And like I said, with TIFI, it's more broad. So it's fixed skyway transit facilities, which is not exclusively rail. It could also be like BRT, uh, also inner city bus stations and passenger rail stations. Uh, public infrastructure 
could include both horizontal infrastructure, say like utilities. It doesn't have to be transportation infrastructure. Like I said, a lot of infrastructure goes into building out um, entire neighborhoods and communities. So it doesn't have to be exclusively transportation infrastructure. Um, also, we, we are able to finance vertical um, public infrastructure. What I mean by that is maybe more civic minded or civic focused types of buildings. Um, and so that, that's kind of within the, the umbrella of public infrastructure, horizontal and vertical development. Um, so the economic development um, kind of provision, uh, this was, this was uh, basically added by Congress to the RIP program under the FAST Act. Um, and actually the sunset on that was, was removed as part of the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law. So TOD as an eligible project type is now part of the RIF program in perpetuity because the sunset was eliminated. So the, the economic development RIF provision has been around for, for many years. Um, economic, economic development is also added to the TIFIA program eligibility under the bipartisan infrastructure law. So that, that is very new. And so it's more or less the same language. Um, there's a few like little differences here, but I'll just say broadly, these are, these are kind of the, the same. And it's basically economic development projects, including commercial, uh, and residential development and related infrastructure. And I'll, I'll say that it's not exclusively commercial and residential development, um, but those are just examples um, that basically have incorporate private investment of greater than 20% of total project costs. Um, there is this relationship, either physical or within basically walking distance of, which is a half mile of a station with rail service. Uh, high, prob high probability of completing or I try convincing the construction contracting process, uh, no later than 90 days. Uh, this is kind of a given just because of how the timing of our own loan programs and when you close on a loan and the need to actually uh, uh, start the bidding process, even have a number to give us um, as far as sizing the loan. So it's usually this one's kind of a, a given as part of our own loan application process. Uh, demonstrates the ability to generate new revenue, um, generate revenue exceeding costs. Um, basically this can't just be a subsidized uh, project, right? It's, it's generating costs for the, um, or I, rather it can't be a project that requires further subsidy from the relevant station or service. Um, and then for RIF, there needs to be a non-federal match of at least 25%. And then for TIFIA, it's a 20% um, non-federal match. This is just um, all the information I gave in, in kind of table form. Um, we, you know, we're happy to share the slides afterwards. Uh, it's kind of a summary. And, and again, uh, TIFIA has this public infrastructure clause as well as the economic development clause, those, are those two columns. Um, economic development requires, uh, that kind of path to eligibility requires private investment. Um, it's more restricted in terms of the qualifying station. Economic development needs to be around rail stations. Um, that's by statute. And then public infrastructure can also include, it, it includes rail, but it's not limited to rail, it can include, uh, you know, bus rapid transit or inner city bus facilities. Um, thinking about kind of just the, the need for, um, you know, advancing many different kind of environmental and, and equity goals. Um, there's really just interesting types of projects that are currently, currently being considered and, and advanced that kind of combine multiple different types of transport, like critical transportation and transit investments with TOD, things like affordable housing, um, you know, daycare, healthcare um, kind of uses. And so thinking about all of the different types of projects that are um, available for financing under TIFI and RIF, it, it, it's, quite, it's quite a large spectrum. And so thinking about the inherent opportunities to say uh, fleet conversion, you know, converting um, you know, bus facilities, O&M facilities, stations uh, to zero emission vehicles. Um, it's going to open up this opportunity for those spaces to become much better neighbors, right? Less polluting, um, which has a really actually important equity component and, and outcome um, as well. But thinking about how we can combine all these different types of projects into to one, one project. And that's kind of what's interesting about the Bureau's own um, programs and eligibility is that we can bundle many different types of projects together. It doesn't, you know, they don't necessarily have to be physically related or even functionally related that we can, we can combine, you know, a, a bus facility and an affordable housing um, project as, as one project. So uh, the Bureau likes to be really creative and that's why we're, you know, we kind of uh, serve as this one-stop shop within DOT is to really explore how, 
how we're scoping projects, um, where different funding sources are coming in, what are potential repayment sources, and really what are the needs of the, the community and the applicant, um, and you know, not just exclusively the transportation improvements, but beyond. Um, I'll mention really quick before I say this, uh, we have a really interesting kind of example um, that, I, you know, in terms of kind of creating new models of development. Um, one example I'll use just out of the out of the Puget Sound area, you know, Seattle, Greater Seattle, and that Seattle has, uh, you know, Seattle taxpayers have put forth a lot of money um, to invest in transit, a massive transit expansion. And, and both FTA and the Bureau have, have played a really critical role in that. The Bureau has, I think, executed over like 3.5 billion in loans just for the link light rail extension. Sound Transit has done a really um, incredible job on the affordable housing front through joint development um, using kind of the excess or leftover properties um, and prioritizing uh, affordable housing joint development. But there's also another component, right, to building out these communities, these transit-oriented communities with the infrastructure and kind of retrofitting these uh, auto-oriented areas, neighborhoods um, to support transit and uh, to support walkability um, and, and, you know, provide people access to, to transit and access to these station areas. And so we've actually done, the Bureau has done another loan um, for the city of Bellevue, which um, is going to be along the East Link um, extension of, of the Link Light Rail, Town Transit Light Rail. And in, in anticipation of this new light rail station um, coming online in the next few years, actually it might be next year or the year after, um, the city actually approached us, about, uh, approached us about a loan to basically uh, redesign their street grid to create a more multimodal network. Like I said, anticipating the need for that and recognizing the opportunity for, um, you know, basically building a new uh, transit-oriented neighborhood or community. Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of an ideal scenario where, um, you know, you have a lot of money and you're ready to, to build transit. And this kind of just diagram is, is a very linear and ideal scenario of, you know, you're building a new transit corridor and um, from the get-go, where do you start? You know, uh, conceptual planning, you can, you can think about holistic, uh, transit and mobility and economic development planning, you know, using the, the TOD planning grant, the kind of conceptual planning and um, to an extent design. Um, and then from there, right, you get into actually like financing and funding the transit capital project, which like I said, um, could include joint development. You know, you could have joint development partners um, and that could be funded through FTA and DOT capital grants as well as bureau loans. Um, you know, most of our most of our loans um, and our projects do have FTA funds in them as well. And then, you know, after the fact, actually executing the the TOD and kind of TOC goals and aims of of, of this kind of ma major transit investment um, or really critical, you know, transit corridor, um, you know, pursue through joint development and, and and bureau loans. Joint development being, as Mia mentioned, you know, any kind of excess properties or properties that um, transit agency could repurpose. And then, you know, the Bureau alone just having these broad authorities to finance transit oriented development as well as infrastructure. Um, so anyways, that's just kind of like a, a, a different models of, um, you know, accessing and, and using these uh, resources, these TO, TOD tools within DOT. Um, and then also, you know, this doesn't even get into all the ones that are outside of the Department of Transportation. But um, anyways, I, I, th this was my last slide. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to present to this um, group alongside my, my colleagues at FTA. Great. Thank you, Robert. That was an excellent presentation. And thank you, April and Mia as well. Uh, lots of good content uh, and lots of great questions coming in uh, through, the, through the chat box. Um, a flurry at the end, so to the point that I, I couldn't keep up with them, but I've got a few flagged here that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll toss over to the group. Um, Scott Bernstein has a, has a, a couple questions about the, um, the National Defense Authorization Act, which, um, you know, as, as, as Mia did uh, briefly note, uh, included the Promoting Affordable Housing Near Transit Act uh, in, included in it, which allow, uh, created a new disposition method um, for uh, land with an FTA interest, uh, as, as long as it meets certain criteria, including being transferred to a nonprofit for affordable housing. Um, Mia, the question is, uh, will there be, are there any, uh, is there any guidance or regs that are coming out on that? And, and what's the timeline for that, if so? 
the answer is yes, there will be guidance coming out on that. We do not currently have a timeline, but we're hoping to at least, um, you know, have some FAQs and update the circulars that will be impacted by it, which would be probably our, like, you know, our land use circular. Um, so stay tuned is unfortunately the answer. Uh, in the meanwhile, feel free to reach out to me directly or um, your regional counterpart for FTA if you want details on it, because this did a take, take effect into law. So it is currently the law um, and it could be taken advantage of now, but we don't have any guidance developed at this point in time. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, I've got another question here that would be best for April. Um, so April, the question uh, is, you know, does FTA have any subrecipient agreement templates that can be utilized for TOD pilot grant program recipients? Uh, it goes on to say, it appears this is necessary for transit agencies that share grant dollars with the city land use authorities who are partners in the TOD studies. Thank you, Dan, uh, for the question. In order to provide the clearest response, I would encourage the participants to email me for more information. Then I can provide the most helpful uh, reply for that question. In addition, um, for immediate um, reference, I would point that participant to the TOD GIS dashboard map where we have um, all of our projects housed and there's information about uh, different partnerships between the different agencies that have applied for the planning grant. Um, so feel free to reference that website, but if you would like to talk one-on-one -on -one with me, I definitely would encourage you to contact me at the email address that is uh, listed in the chat box. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. I think this next one is best for Robert, but Mia, you may have uh, something to say about it as well. Um, the question is, could a private developer use TIFIA or RIF loan proceeds to build a parking structure for transit users on one parcel and then build a residential building adjacent to that without federalizing the residential project? Uh, I assume that it's assuming the, the residential project would not be part of the project scope uh, financed by the TIFIA or RIF loan. I think that's a fair assumption of the question, but but if you ask the question and I didn't get that right, please clarify. But uh, yeah, Robert, what, maybe Robert, you could start with that. Does does the federal requirements apply to an adjacent residential building if a if if a tip your rip loan were used to construct parking the parking nearby? Um, I would say it's it's not a given that that you know the project would be federalized, and I'm I'm just thinking about kind of precedent projects, um, even projects that have um, an overbuild over the transit, federalized transit component. I know of projects that, that the actual vertical construction overbuild is not federalized. So I don't think it's a given. I think it comes down to whether, um, yeah, it, it really depends. I, I mean, there's, there's probably a chance that you do NEPA for the entire project, but that is, I don't know if you'd necessarily trigger anything else beyond that it's a it's a really good question it's really it's very very much project specific right and i, I think similar to what april said you know before i think if this it, you know it is very case by case as robert said so it, it really depends yeah. on the nuances of the project scope um the kind of relationship between the parking garage and the and the residential building um and 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 the you know the 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 either federal grant or loan funds that are used um, and, the, and the requirements that they invoke. So uh, that definitely encourage the, 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 uh, the, the person, I think it was anonymous, who asked the question to, uh, to reach out to Robert or, or myself to uh, get clarity on that. Um, so this is a question that's uh, for, for really all the speakers. Um, the uh, question is from, um, uh, Dinah Lazarus um, would like to know how affordable housing is or will be incorporated into TOD guidance uh, for you know either uh, in FTA guidance or bureau guidance um, or no foes as required or encouraged as part of uh, the projects that they fund uh, or finance. Um, so why don't we start with uh, with with, um, with with April? You provided a nice response here in the chat box, but maybe you could verbalize that and uh, and Mia. Robert could respond with how it affects uh, how joint development and, and bureau loan programs will respond. Thank you, Dan, and uh, to Dana. The current NOFO um, does 
outlined that the MAP 21 standards require that comprehensive or site specific planning funding um, does incorporate affordable housing elements, uh, which will uh, fall within the realm of mixed use development. And our current NOFO in the last seven NOFOs does reflect that. And then the FTA administration does encourage um, participants to include affordable housing plans or policies within their proposals. Uh, so to just fall in line with uh, the question is currently reflected, we do encourage it. Um, and if you have any further questions, feel free to contact me as well. Mia, does, joint, does FTA's joint development policy encourage or require affordable housing in any uh, way? Yeah, you know, we changed our rule a couple years ago to, um, as I mentioned previously, not require a minimum threshold um, for fair share of revenue. And one of the reasons we did that was to try and encourage um, folks to engage in projects like affordable housing projects that might not bring in as much revenue as as some other projects might, but, but provide abundant community benefits. Um, I don't have a great answer to this offhand. I, you know, the, the NDAA provision for disposition, I think, is um, a really a positive one in terms of allowing folks to, I saw somebody say, is this a workaround for joint development? And in a sense, it a little bit is, right? It's, it gives um, folks an option to just dispose of the property to use for um, affordable housing if they'd rather not keep the federal interest in the land. And so that, that's another option. Um, and then lastly, there is just a lot of internal work being done right now at FTA. I am not um, on all the uh, committees and things that we have working on affordable housing issues, but we do currently have a working group with, the, um, with HUD uh, to, to try and figure out how we can leverage our programs as much as possible to sort of support um, federal, uh, affordable housing in, in light of the housing crisis in the United States. So. Uh, stay tuned. I hope there will be more. So, uh, yeah, on, on, on the Bureau front, um, we're also involved in the, 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 the TOD group as well, um, multi-agency. And actually, I'm probably my, my third TOD working group that I'm involved in. Um, so on the affordable housing talk, topic, um, the Bureau does, you know, in, in our current cre credit programs guide, kind of list the types of projects. Um, related to kind of economic development that we'd like to see, but um, our, we currently have an effort underway, or we will soon be underway rather, um, to update our credit programs guide, um, and hopefully to address some, some questions around types of projects that we might want to prioritize. This is still very much on the table. You know, uh, the Bureau has, is, is months away from creating this new guidance. Um, I will say though that uh, what's on, this is on the table because we, we do have kind of this need to, um, Craft some some policies or some preferences around the bipartisan infrastructure laws um, cap on the TOD credit subsidy um, under TIFIA. So there's a 15% cap. So in a world in which there's scarcity for um, uh, for our loans, basically, or for, for for financing, and we're limited to um, you know that 15% cap, then the bureau is going to have to at some point create this. Um, you know, framework, evaluation framework for prioritizing certain types of projects and, and affordable housing, as well as some other projects. I mean, it's definitely been a topic of conversation. Um, it's so, so again, it's kind of like, stay tuned. We, we're not at that point, but um, we're just starting on creating um, new guidance right right now. For And it's not just limited to TOD or affordable housing. It's, it's the Bureau's rewriting all of our guidance, essentially updating it, I should say, not rewriting it. Okay. We had a number of other really good questions. A couple of these should should uh, be fairly fairly easy, so we can tick through a few of them. Um, under the TIFI and RIF programs, does a public sponsor of a private developer's application, uh, so a private borrower but a public sponsor, does the public sponsor have liability in place in case of default, or does the sponsorship simply indicate the public ag agency's support for the application? Uh, so obviously that's to you, Robert. Um, I would say it's just. Indicating support. Um, uh, it's a little bit different, TIFIA versus RIF. So, TIFIA, it's just public sponsorship, and that, you know, the project is like, you know, it's for planning programming pur pur purposes. The, the public sponsor is not on the loan agreement. There's, there's, you know, there's no really involvement other than just recognizing that there's some type of public sponsorship. It's, it's similar on the RIF side, um, but I think like the threshold's a little bit higher. 
in that there needs to be some type of like joint venture. Um, and the, the, what I mean by like a little bit higher threshold is that um, the, if, if the pu public sponsor and, and public party within the eligible joint venture kind of agreement, um, they're not part of the loan agreement itself, they're not a financial obligor, then we just need um, a letter from them saying that we understand that this private developer is invoking our eligibility as part of this partnership, this joint venture agreement or partnership uh, to qualify for RIF or TIFIA, uh, or sorry, RIF, RIF, RIF financing. So, so the short answer is no, you know, you're not on the hook, the, the, private, or the public entity is not on the hook. Yeah, I think that's great. Great answer, Robert. Thank you. Um, the next one's for April. Uh, I think actually everyone might have something to say about this, but just so we can kind of move through some of these more questions, I think this is more of a planning related question anyway. Are, uh, April, are there any policies in place to control gentrification around TOD sites? Uh, do, does the planning grant program, you know, have any criteria to, to control that? Uh, what, and what is being done to ensure communities and vulnerable populations are not dis, uh, displaced? Thank you, Dan, for that question. Uh, currently, within the TOD NOFO, uh, which was released uh, last spring, it did include Executive Order 13985, which focused on advancing racial equity within the TOD proposals. As a result, um, applicants are encouraged to provide context about how they will um, prevent at risk populations from being displaced. Um, and we do encourage um, applicants to um, present information in their proposals that would mitigate uh, displacement within the subject area. So we are um, in favor of proposals that do um, enhance the particular subject area, create sustainable development, and reflect uh, the Executive Order 13985. So there are uh, policies in place and um, the TOD program is in alignment with that. But if you have any further questions about um, how we are addressing um, displacement, feel free to email me as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, one more uh, uh, for, for Robert here. Um, what are, for the loan programs, what are some of the most common sources of repayment for the loans? Um, Great question. It really depends on kind of who the borrower is. Um, like I said, TOD is a bit of a new frontier for us. Um, the Bureau has done a, a significant number of transit loans and, you know, for public infrastructure and transportation infrastructure projects, the borrower has typically been a public entity and therefore the, in many cases, some form of like tax revenues have been um, the pledge, the, the repayment source. That's not exclusively that, you know, we, we just closed on Moynihan um, Station, sorry, on a, on a refinance loan for Moynihan Station. And in that project, the pledge was actually pilots, which is payment in lieu of taxes. Um, and there were some kind of real estate, um, there, there was like a real estate and, and, and TIF component to both Moynihan as well as the Denver Union Station project. So it could be, you know, real estate revenues, leases, taxes through tax in increment financing. Um, but like I said, the, the Bureau has focused more on, uh, you know, to date historically, um, also because the TOD provisions are, are newer compared to the, exist the, the two decade long existence of TIFIA RIF. Um, they've been more uh, public um, monies, you know, I would say, uh, but that's not to say that the Bureau can't kind of think about different types of under, uh, uh, of different revenue streams to underwrite. Like, you know, we've done fare box revenues and, you know, maybe advertising revenues. And like I said, leases, I mean, um, those are definitely all on the table. Okay, I think uh, Hillary, let me know how many, um, if, if we need to just jump in, if we're, I know we're running short, but um, got one more, I guess, for, for, uh, go for it. Okay, uh, one more for, uh, for Mia. Do you have any particular tips for potential joint development projects that may be considering value capture tools as part of their funding mix? Um, and, do you have any examples of joint development projects that have used value capture uh, mechanisms and that in, com in combination with TIFIA loans? That's a great question. That, that, that could That's a great question that yeah. I kind of want you to answer, Dan, since you have both the expertise on both sides of that. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm trying to think of a value capture 
um, example, I think there we had a, a station in Boston, if I'm not correct, that included like um, some naming rights in addition to joint development. And that would be an example of value capture. Um, I, I know we use the soccer stadium example in uh, Minnesota sometimes as a value capture, which was a, a joint development uh, project where the soccer stadium was built and partially with FTA lands. Um, as far as TIFIA goes, I don't think we have any examples that specifically include TIFIA funds, but correct me if I'm wrong, Dan. You know, I'd have to go back and look to see if they have um, what, what the funding streams were, but there were there have been a number of projects that have gotten TIFIA loans that facilitated TOD in some, in some respect. Um, thinking of a station access project in uh, Bellevue, Washington, around one of the sound transit station that kind of reorganized the street network to uh, facilitate access. Um, forget exactly what the, I'd have to check what the repayment stream is there, if it was value, value capture or if there was value capture um, mechanism in place in that community. Um, great question. Let's, let's kind of mm -hmm. circle back on that. Hillary, yeah. are we out of time? Do we have time for one more? I would say if you guys have time, um to go for it. And if you could make sure to tell people how they would contact you all oh. after we close, that would be great. Oh, I see it right there. Thank you, Robert. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so this would be for, for April. Um, April, if, a, if an agency received a TOD pilot uh, program grant in a previous funding uh, award uh, opportunity, um, are they eligible to reapply and, and be considered for a future award? Thank you, Dan, for the question. Yes, a project may or an applicant may be eligible for consideration, um, but applicants would need to make it clear how the proposed planning work differs from the previous uh, planning work. So that includes just providing more context about the project when you do apply. Um, but yes, it is possible that you can apply uh, two years in a row or several years in a row. Okay, I've got another one that's fairly, that should be pretty easy to answer and quick. Um, Robert, can the loan programs be used in combination or as local match for other uh, DOT federal grant programs or, um, or, or, or you know, for, for any, for any uh, federal grant program? Uh, yeah, so, so yes, I just, I just say yes. Um, they, they are considered the, the part of the local financial commitment. Um, which is actually codified for RIF and the infrastructure law. I will say though that for TIFIA, there is a maximum 80% just federal contribution or share. And that, so that actually 80% does include grants and, and loans. Um, otherwise it's, it's the local financial commitment. Okay. There are so many great questions. I mean, I'm really very proud of this audience for how many really excellent, <laughs> excellent questions came through. Um, even after we're done answering them live here, we'll, we'll go through and make sure that they all get answered or um, responded to in some way. So um, thanks again. Um, I mean, I think we're out of time. I, I, I already see a lot of people signing off, so maybe we could wrap, maybe we should wrap it up. <laughs>